Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, I'm Rick Harnish. I'm the executive director of the High Speed Rail Alliance. Uh, we're a nonprofit uh, located in Chicago with a remote office in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and we want to thank you all for joining us today to learn more about the Northern Lights Express that will link uh, Minneapolis to Superior, Wisconsin, and Duluth, Minnesota. Um, for those who aren't familiar with us, uh, we strive to be uh, the most knowledgeable independent source of what high-speed rail is, uh, why we should build it, and what steps local leaders and state leaders need to take in order to make it a reality and get it built. Uh, we do uh, uh, this through a variety of programs. Uh, including uh, researching problem, uh, looking for solutions to problems, educating folks through a variety of forums, for example, uh, Rotary Clubs and other civic uh, organizations. And uh, we're always welcome to hear from you if, if you want to have a specific one given, um, and then helping people have the tools they need in order to educate their leaders in uh, in DC or in state capitals. Um, we believe what we call the integrated network approach where uh, high-speed lines work with regional lines and shared use lines and bus lines in a network uh, in order to connect entire regions together as opposed to the typical way of thinking of looking at short city pair combinations Let's look at big networks so that we can make the most out of each piece uh, and make it really work well. And that has the advantage of bringing a lot more people into the political fold in order to create the big program we need in order to make trains successful um, across the country. So um, one of the uh, exciting projects that we have in the Midwest that's pretty much ready to go is the Northern Lights Express. Um, and so I want to uh, introduce uh, Ken Bueller, who is the, um, I'm sorry, I just blanked, the chair of the technical committee for Northern Lights. Ken, are you ready? Yes. <laughs> Uh, yes, good afternoon. I am ready. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted, actually. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'd also like to introduce uh, Greg Mathis, who is uh, with me here. He is with the Minnesota Department of Transportation and is uh, assigned to portions of the Northern Lights Express project, along with three other MnDOT employees whose scope of work also includes aspects of, Mid of this now MnDOT project called the Northern Lights Express. So take it away. Absolutely, let's go. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you all for tuning in. Thanks to Richard Harnish for the invitation. And more importantly, thank you to everyone on this presentation today for all you do and have done to support the progress of promoting increased passenger rail service across the great country of ours. The High Speed Rail Alliance is at the forefront of this effort and a leader going back to the organization's founding in 1993. As you prepare next year to celebrate your organization's 30th anniversary, let's all work extra hard this year to make sure we have more passenger trains running and running faster than at any time in recent history. And if those new trains aren't running in 2023, Let's make sure that rail is being laid, passenger cars are being made, and stations are going up along right-of-ways from one end of America to the other. If it seems like this is a slow process, please do not be discouraged. The first mention of a transcontinental railroad in this country was a motion in Congress by Dr. Hartwell Carver, promoting a railroad to the Pacific. That was in 1847, 16 years before the first spike was pounded and 22 years before the golden spike was driven into a laurel wood tie at Promontory Point. Perseverance is the key to any successful endeavor. 
With respect for history and always an eye on the ball that is the future, passenger rail, high speed passenger rail is achievable. Working together, we can achieve the goal of having more passenger trains running and running faster than at any time in recent history. One of those new passenger lines is going to be the Northern Lights Express. It's going to connect the twin ports of Duluth here in Minnesota and Superior across the bridge in Wisconsin with downtown Minneapolis. At a top speed of 90 miles an hour, travel time from Duluth to a Twins game or anything else in the Metro would be two hours and 30 minutes. We're planning on running four round trips a day. The 152 mile journey is over existing tracks owned by BNSF and shared by Union Pacific and Canadian Pacific. There's plenty of excess capacity on this route. And as you can see, Analex is also an important part of the Minnesota State Rail Plan. More importantly, the engines pulling this train will move at the highest environmental standards. Trains have the lowest carbon footprint per passenger mile of any form of transportation, other than ferry boats and cruise ships. And I don't think we're gonna get a cruise ship line between Duluth and Minneapolis. NLX is simple transportation. It will appeal to a myriad of travelers who will use the train in many different ways. On the lower end of the route, as you approach the Twin Cities, the line will act as a commuter and not just an intercity train. This will eliminate one of the biggest drags currently on the American economy, wasted time caused by traffic congestion. A recent study by Texas A&M Transportation Institute found that congestion for Metro commuters cost the US economy over $180 billion a year. A more recent study by the transportation research record shows that if you build it, they will come. In examining congested highways, the study found that adding more lanes only added more cars. The phenomenon is known as induced demand. You can't build your way out of congestion with just more concrete. You need an alternative. We have a beautiful country to travel through, but the great American road trip is on life support. That's because you hit ever increasing traffic delays and pass by the same homogenized strip malls over and over and over and over again. If you wanna see the USA, park your Chevrolet and take a train. We learned during the pandemic that for many workers, their office can be anywhere. Furthermore, these remote offices may well be the very same ones all these stay at home workers will retire from. People no longer have to live where they work. They can work where they live. And where they live could be much more affordable than if they have to live near the office. This train is about workforce development in Duluth Superior and in rural areas along the line. Let's just take Pine County as an example. It rests about halfway along the corridor or just one hour and 10 minutes by train from downtown Minneapolis. Up until the Great Recession, 90% of all new jobs in Minnesota were created in the seven county Twin City metro area. Not anymore. In beautiful Bind County, rents are 30% less than they are in Minneapolis. Home ownership is more affordable as well. Some of the fastest growing areas in Minnesota lie along the route of the Northern Lights Express. Remote workers are good for employers too. Just this past year, Target cleared out an entire building in downtown Minneapolis, saving on rent. Businesses can now recruit new hires from across the country and not just within driving distance. Businesses also can save on relocation costs of new employees. This is a way for companies to increase their workforce diversity. This project is also about economic development. 3,000 jobs over several years of construction increase property values along the entire corridor because we all know transportation is good for the neighborhood. For Duluth Superior and Northern Minnesota and Wisconsin, areas very heavily dependent on tourism, NLX pays a handsome dividend. As I showed you a moment ago, there are well over 2,500 veterans in Pine County, almost 20,000 where I live here in St. Louis County, and over 50,000 American vets residing along the NLX corridor. These are older men and women who may need medical assistance from the VA hospital located in Minneapolis. For many of our great veterans, their only way to get to the VA now is in a van driven by volunteer drivers, most as old or even older than the vets they're driving. Taking NLX to Target Field, transfer to the Blue Line light rail, and our great veterans are conveniently and safely dropped off right at the front door of the VA clinic and hospital in Minneapolis. So where are we today? This project will be built with 80% federal dollars. 
to be fundable under the requirements of the Federal Railroad Administration, which will be using money approved in the recently passed bipartisan infrastructure law, you have to have something called a FONSI. It's a finding of no significant impact. Now that means all of these things seen here must be completed and approved, the largest of which and the most expensive was a three-year two-tier environmental assessment. It took almost 20 years and over $14.5 million to get our finding of no significant impact. We, the NLX board, did all that work. The Northern Lights Express Group is handing Amtrak and the FRA a shovel-ready project. This is something that Amtrak's Vice President Joe McHugh recognized and commented on while reviewing the NLX project in Duluth. Of the 30 new passenger rail projects in the US proposed by Amtrak under their Connect plan, NLX was the only one with this designation, meaning we're the only one that is shovel ready. Northern Lights Express continues to work with Amtrak, the likely operator of the line, and BNSF, the owner of the tracks that we'll be running on. Both companies are extremely supportive of this project. For Amtrak, this is further expansion of their network in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Amtrak service between Chicago and Milwaukee is expanding, and a second train each day is approved between Chicago and St. Paul. In fact, the final agreement for funding that TCMC train is being signed next week during a ceremony at the Amtrak station in La Crosse, Wisconsin. In Washington, D.C., the new infrastructure law has over $16 billion to build passenger rail projects like Northern Lights Express. There's another $2 billion available for grade crossing improvements that could also be tapped for specific parts of NLX. Of course, we are focusing on bringing the entire NLX project to fruition at one time, but we're also dealing with a critical choke point on the route, a choke point on the BNSF line between Duluth and Superior that'll be used by NLX, but is crucial to freight traffic in and out of the port of Duluth and Superior. The Grassy Point Drawbridge, this is the railroad bridge connecting Duluth to Superior over the St. Louis River. Now the way to speed up train trips is not making the faster portions of your trip go faster, but to speed up the slowest parts of the journey. The Grassy Point drawbridge is the slowest point on our route. Currently, freight trains are restricted to a crawl of just five miles an hour when crossing the span. That's slow for freight standards, but for passenger trains, it is intolerable. Besides the future and NLX, the bridge carries all of the commercial freight coming into and out of the port of Duluth, with the exception of iron ore. It is also the only way out of town for high and wide loads, which is something the port of Duluth is very good at. This is a big year for the Grassy Point draw. The bridge is 110 years old. Three years ago, the bridge malfunctioned, it broke. Though it was inoperable for only a few weeks, it took months and months to unsnarl the backlog of trains, ships, and freight cars. Last year, the Minnesota State Legislature approved $3 million in bonding funds to be used to match federal dollars through a proposed Chrissy grant. Rebuilding the bridge will guarantee its integrity and increase passenger train speeds to 20 or more miles an hour, at least four times faster than they are right now. Upgrading the bridge is a win-win for freight reliability now and faster passenger trains in the not too distant future. We received those dollars because we had the support of the biggest player in the room, the Seaway Port Authority of Duluth. A letter of support was circulated to our elected officials stating the case for the bridge investment. And you know what? It worked. The letter came from Duluth Seaway Port Authority Director, Deb DeLuca. Funding for this project is as close as it's been in the 20 plus years that we've been promoting and working on NLX. Currently, there are bills in both the Minnesota House and Senate. One is seeking $85 million in bonding, the other $85 million as an appropriation. As with all things in life, and especially in politics, you never get everything you ask for. More than likely, and this is our plan, it'll be some combination of both funding requests that will provide the desired results of having a 20% match for the federal funds to build NLX. By the way, Minnesota is sitting on an expected nine and a quarter billion dollar surplus on top of a $1 billion rainy day fund. So uh, we think our odds are looking pretty good. 
Wisconsin Governor Tony Evers has endorsed this project, a total cost of uh, $425 million, of which 340 will come from the feds. But because 13% of the trackage runs through the Badger State, they are being asked to improve the minimum 20% state match by adding an additional 10, 12, and maybe $15 million. Now, if you're tuned into this presentation in Minnesota or Wisconsin, please, you can do something. Contact your governor and your commissioner of transportation and state your support to the state for Northern Lights Express and that local match. This train is about workforce development. It's for veterans getting safely to the VA, for trips to the Twin Cities, for shopping, dining, sporting events and concerts, or to visit friends and relatives. And if you're coming to Duluth for any or all of those same reasons, or to visit the largest body of fresh water on the planet Earth, you'll be able to take a train. And protecting that lake and the planet as a whole means more environmentally sound travel options. We know that trains are one of the ways to reduce our carbon footprint. This is a train for the future, a future that's already here. This is a train that will change everything. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Chris, do we have any questions? Yes, we do. Um... And uh, let's start uh, at the top. Um, uh, there was a question from uh, Bradley Hazy. Um, how will the Northern Lights Express connect to Amtrak in St. Paul? Greg, I'll take that first one if that's all right. Uh, go ahead. Um, St. Paul, Minneapolis has a very, uh, very robust uh, public transit system with buses and two and soon three light rail lines. Uh, the one light rail line that I referenced uh, is the blue line, and that goes south from Target Field in downtown Minneapolis. That's the one that connects to the VA hospital that I spoke about. It will also take you to the Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport, and then eventually to the Mall of America. The green line heads east out of downtown Minneapolis. It crosses the river. It uh, goes through the University of Minnesota's main campus in St. Paul, stops at the uh, state capitol, and then finally at Union Depot in downtown St. Paul, where one will connect with the Amtrak trains. Currently two Amtrak trains serve Minnesota. It's the uh, morning and late night uh, uh, builder. And then uh, this new TCMC, Twin City, uh, Milwaukee, Chicago run that I spoke of, and that'll be uh, a daylight run, one round trip. So uh, we will have four trains a day at St. Paul's Union Depot, which if you've never been there, I highly recommend a trip. Uh, the restoration of that was a Congressman Overstar project. Uh, he got them $254 million to, uh, to renovate that depot and turn it into a multimodal transportation hub, as well as saving a gorgeous building on the National Register of Historic Places. So that's how you connect with Amtrak. Great, thank you. And uh, having uh, having been at least once or twice to that uh, renovated station, I can uh, I can attest to how wonderfully it uh, it turned out. I was uh, I was amazed. Um, uh, so thank you for that answer. Um, and uh, I'm going to try to group the questions kind of thematically. Um, uh, the uh, this one is uh, let's see, comes from David Winters. Um, what are your plans for average speed, elapsed time, and frequency? Very good question. Thank you for that. Um, our top speed will be 90 miles an hour. Uh, that will just be on, uh, it looks like one segment about halfway through the trip. Uh, the rest of the trip speeds will be um, at the Amtrak speed of uh, between 60 and 79 miles an hour uh, with the exception of that choke point that I spoke about. So your travel time on the entire route uh, from start to finish about two hours and 30 minutes. Uh, from the halfway point Hinkley, and one of the reasons this works so well is at Hinkley, there's the Grand Casino. Um, and that wasn't there in that 1999 study uh, that I talked about, or I can reference if you'd like. But um, one of the things that changed the economic dynamics of this project was the construction of that casino. In our transportation models, that Grand Casino in Hinkley, about halfway uh, through the trip route, and only about an hour and 10 minutes from uh, downtown Minneapolis, 
That performs, if it's a city of a million people, there are so many comings and goings to that casino. And if you look at where their customers come from, it's a triangle with the point being at Hinkley and the base being halfway through the Twin Cities. So that's really a lot of what makes this work is that casino. So the travel time is about two and a half hours for the whole route, one and a half or one minute or one hour and 10 minutes uh, halfway through and four trips a day uh, starting early in the morning and ending in late evening. Thank you. And uh, a related question uh, from Yangbo Du. Uh, will there be any effort at enabling, enabling hourly frequencies, uh, maybe at some point in the future, uh, by scheduling around the freight railroads? Um, you know, we haven't really thought that far ahead. Um, Greg might want to chime in on this one, but um, one of the mistakes we made, and heaven knows we've made many in the years that we've been on this, one of the mistakes we made right off the top at the suggestion of our mentor, Congressman Oberstar, was that this would be a Federal Transit Administration train um, because there's more money available and it revolves. Um, but after looking at that, and that of course would be more frequency on that lower half for a commuter because that's what uh, the FTA is looking for. We looked at it that way at first and then it dawned on us that we were really an intercity train and we're more likely to qualify under the Federal Rail Administration program, which is not as robust funded at the time, but of course now with the infrastructure law it is. Um, the problem with increased frequency at the lower end of the line where it performs like a commuter is to maybe get us trapped into what's happening to North Star, which is a commuter line from Minneapolis that heads west towards Big Lake and St. Cloud. And uh, as with many commuter lines, you know, passenger counts have plummeted due to the pandemic. Um, in Minnesota, there's a huge political effort right now that's not very favorable to North Star. And um, one of the problems we have is being compared to North Star. And our answer to that is we are not North Star. We are an intercity passenger rail service, not a commuter service, and therefore maybe the answer to North Star is to be more like us as opposed to us being, you know, lopped in with them. So to answer that question, no, I don't see us taking on a commuter role. We are a Federal Railroad Administration interpassenger, intercity passenger line, and frequent stops are only going to slow us down. We've got to be competitive with the automobile. Uh, automobile train or automobile trip from Duluth to downtown Minneapolis is about two and a half hours. So we're competitive on the train. If we lose that competitive advantage, uh, then we lose one of the things that uh, is gonna make the train more successful. And that is to be able to compete with the car. And by the way, the traffic between Duluth and Minneapolis on I-35 is such that if we get one to 2% of that traffic to go from their cars to the train, we'll hit our numbers. It, this is Greg, I would just add uh, as part of our analysis, we did look at up to eight trains a day, mm -hmm. and the, the four trains a day ended up being the sweet spot, being the most cost-effective version. So that's where we're, we're we settled on. And that's uh, yeah, Chris. That's a good point. I forgot about that. So thanks for chiming in. That's good. And uh, well, thank you both. And uh, next question comes from Laurie Higgins. Um, you, you, Ken, you spoke already to the, uh, you know, some of the costs involved in this project, uh, but Laurie's question is, uh, what are the anticipated yearly operational costs once uh, the NLX gets built and the taxpayer sub subsidies needed to fund it? Uh, back a moment, I forgot that Rick chimed in on that. So I gave Chris credit. I really meant to thank Rick for uh, pointing out the sweet spot at four trains a day. Um, as far as the operating expenses of this, um, we're anticipating after a three-year ramp up, somewhere around 785,000 uh, guest passengers a year. Um, we'll have a fare box recovery of somewhere between 70 and 74%. And there will be a subsidy required. And Rick, or rather Rick, Greg, um, help me on making sure I get this number right. Um, somewhere in the neighborhood of five to $7 million a year. Is that what I'm 
thinking? Um, you know, we've looked at the, we haven't done an updated cost analysis. It was it, a few years ago, we were looking at the range of between three to 5 million a year. Yeah. And so really the way we've been looking at this is in terms of that operating revenue. And so we're looking at probably after the first year, about roughly about 64% fair box recovery, and then within 20 years, it would be about 75%. Thank you. Great, um, thank you both. And uh, there were, uh, that, that question uh, answered or responded to a couple of people who were uh, interested in, in, you know, similar aspects of this. Um, let's, uh, and, and there are actually a couple of other uh, finance related questions. Um, from uh, from Mike Engelhart, um, once funding is secured, how long would it take to improve the line uh, for passenger trains to start running? Greg, again, uh, if I'm wrong on this, uh, please uh, chime in and, and correct me. But um, I think at our last uh, Joint Powers Alliance meeting, uh, Frank uh, Letterly, our MinDOT uh, supervisor on the project, said that uh, funding approval to running trains would be somewhere in the neighborhood of three years if Amtrak is the uh, operator. Did I get that right? Yeah, we're, we're assuming it would be about between three and four years, depending on when the funding is available and uh, how long it takes to negotiate some of the agreements. And look, looking at our climate, we also have to factor in when we can actually start construction. So. The actual construction work that will be necessary, um, as I said, this line exists already. It's all welded rail. Uh, it one time carried passenger trains of uh, up to 70 miles an hour. Um, and of course, we need to improve that. Uh, and that means, you know, um, some work on the curves for elevated curvatures. Um, what we really want to do is increase the length of sidings so that uh, between the passenger trains and the NLX trains, uh, they don't have to stop. They can pass each other while moving. Um, we have to build station stops along the way. Um, in Duluth, that'll be the uh, historic Union Depot where the Lake Spear Railroad Museum is, where I'm talking to you from today. Uh, but other places like Coon, uh, well, Coon Rapids, there's already a station there for the light rail that could share. Uh, but um, places like Cambridge are going to have to build a station from scratch uh, because they've moved it from its historic location to a new location downtown. So that is all the work that's going to have to be done uh, to, to make this project viable. So. Um, as Greg said, uh, it's about three to four years. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, I think this is the last question about money, at least uh, for what we have now. Uh, Roger Huff asks, how much is BNSF contributing to the bridge project that you described? Roger, that's a very good uh, question. Um, we've got three uh, million dollars right now from a state bonding bill two years ago. Um, we would like to get a Chrissy grant, uh, and that again would be a 2080. So that gets you up to about 15 to 16 million. And the total project is estimated at 17 to 18 million. So uh, that missing couple million dollars there is going to have to come from somewhere. But we think if we, and BNSF is familiar with this pro project, I mean, they're well aware of it. This is not a surprise. We're not going to walk in uh, and do this, but that's a MnDOT project as well. So maybe Greg would like to comment on, on where that sits. Um, sure. So th there's some ongoing conversations with BNSF, um, and that's actually happening out of our freight office. Um, the bridge is currently operable. It meets BNSF's needs. So a lot of the, it's going to be largely improvements. Um, we have a swing bridge, and so a lot of this gets into signals and interlock improvements needed to increase speeds across passenger train speeds across the bridge. So um, that's uh, those conversations are ongoing, um, and, but it's being handled out of our freight office. So I don't have a lot more to say at this point. Okay. Great. Um, uh, the next uh, couple of questions, uh, I guess, maybe come from the standpoint of riders. Um, Kirk Schneider asks, why can't the train run through to St. Paul? Uh, having to connect to light rail uh, will reduce ridership. Well, he's absolutely right in saying that. Anytime you have a break in transportation, two things happen. Uh, the first thing is that uh, you lose some of those passengers uh, that aren't going to make that uh, transition. Uh, the other thing is that uh, anytime you have a break in transportation, that's where economic development occurs. Now, 
there's not a lot of economic development that's left in the downtown Minneapolis area. They're doing pretty well. But uh, Duluth, uh, on the other hand, um, man, we could use, you know, uh, our part of town. Uh, there's space, there's availability, uh, there's room, there's land. So economic development uh, can occur because anytime you have a break in transportation, uh, since the earliest of times, that's when you get economic development. Anytime that train stops or that boat can't go through the uh, over the falls at St. Anthony in downtown Minneapolis, those are all uh, opportunities. However, um, going by train from uh, Minneapolis across to St. Paul is a long and laborious process. If the swing bridge in Duluth is a choke point, going beyond downtown Minneapolis is another one. And while $16, $17 million fixes the choke point here in Duluth Superior, uh, the choke point south of Minneapolis to cross the river to get into St. Paul and then head north again is even longer and more laborious. Switching to the light rail is an alternative, um, but it's uh, give yourself a good 45 minutes. Uh, I think that uh, maybe, maybe even longer, Greg. I haven't taken that route since I went to a Viking game a couple of years ago, but uh, it's, uh, it has a lot of stops, as all uh, good uh, commuter lines do. Um, but uh, uh, there's also bus uh, service. And I could see that, you know, um, the amount of people that are going to take Union Depot as a uh, destination to connect with Amtrak, I could see a designated high-speed uh, bus route that wouldn't have any stops. It would be the train comes in, uh, the bus or buses are there, uh, the people get on. Uh, and the next place they stop is at Union Depot. That might speed up that uh, trans transit over to the Amtrak uh, connection. Yeah, I would, I would just add that looking at when the, the builders travel times, those don't necessarily line up great with some of the travel that we would are projecting between the Twin Cities and the Twin Ports. So, um, you know, it's a little bit lower priority than it might seem on the surface, but there, you know, we are looking at, there have been some studies looking how to make that connection, but um, it's a further out project. That's a great point. Thanks, Greg. A another argument for a lot more frequencies on both routes so that they do connect well. Also a very good point. Thanks. <laughs> And uh, related to uh, these, uh, these questions and comments, uh, Jonathan Gran asks, do any of the planned trips, currently planned trips align with current Amtrak schedules into and out of St. Paul, or will there be long waits? I think Greg kind of alluded to that. Uh, MnDOT has looked into that and um, while not purposely uh, avoiding each other, um, yeah, there's gonna be a little bit of a wait, but. You know, that's the same thing if you fly and have to do a plane change in Chicago. Uh, uh, if you fly from Minneapolis or you fly anywhere from Duluth, the, Duluth only goes to Chicago or Minneapolis. So um, with other forms of transportation, it's, it's not as seamless. Uh, even with all the airplanes and all the schedules and all the planes and the huge O'Hara airport, um, you can still uh, wait long enough to have a couple of beers. I mean, the lunch. I, I would just add that. Uh... Ken had mentioned this a little bit earlier, but we are uh, in the process of getting a second train between the Twin Cities and Chicago, and those connections will line up, will do a lot to help reduce some of those uh, wait times and connections between uh, NLX and points east. Great. Uh, here we have uh, two questions uh, from people anticipating or hoping for connections to other cities. Uh, first one is also from Jonathan. Uh, is there any chance of expanding the service to International Falls? Um, I suppose in, in some wild world in the future, that's, that's possible. Um, I don't know if that's a destination as much as, uh, no offense to International Falls, it's a beautiful community. Uh, but I'm not so sure that's the same destination point as, uh, say, Duluth Superior, which uh, has a incredible number of 7 million guest visitors a year that come to enjoy our wonderful city. Um, and as I said, we only need 1% or 2% of those uh, north of Hinkley to, to help our uh, fare box recovery. Um, 
one of the things, and th these are pipe dreams. So do I have a moment? I'll talk about a pipe dream if somebody wants to uh, hear that. We operate the North Shore Scenic Railroad, which is a tourist line on an old uh, Duluth and Iron Range uh, uh, lakefront line that goes from downtown Duluth to downtown Two Harbors. And there connects with Canadian National, the former DMNIR, and that goes up to the beautiful Iron Range, Minnesota's glorious Iron Range, I might add. One of the things that uh, in the world of pipe dreams is that, uh, and we wouldn't run this every weekend, but a couple times in the winter, a couple times in the summer, uh, you could get on our train, much slower than 90 miles an hour, I might add, but you're on vacation, so what do you care? Uh, and take this slow train up to two harbors and then continue on Canadian National all the way to a place called Bewabek. Now in Bewabek, the Iron Range Resources and Rehabilitation Board has built a beautiful Giants Ridge ski area and two world-class championship golf courses as part of their economic redevelopment for, as I said, Minnesota's glorious Iron Range. So I could see a couple of special golf outing trips in the summer, and I could definitely see running trains over the winter, uh, especially between Christmas and New Year's when ski hills are at their busiest. Um, but that comes under the heading of pipe dream. But uh, once in a while, you know, it's kind of fun just to sit back and think, what if? So that that was that's my pipe dream. And if you're not seeing it in the chat, you're getting some encouragement to dream. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> what about uh, here's one other destination question. Uh, any plans to extend to Rochester? Well, that's being discussed. I know there's a group that's uh, working on that. There's a there's a group in Minnesota and Wisconsin. You probably have them around the country too. Uh, all aboard Minnesota, all aboard Wisconsin, and uh, they like uh, Rick's uh, kind of what I like to think of as the umbrella organization to all this um, are promoting different routes to different places. And you know, <laughs> we've been at this for 20 years. We slugged out. 14 and a half million dollars in different grants that we've parceled together here and there. We did everything to get a finding of no significant impact at just the right time. We missed the economic opportunity of the stimulus years when there was money from stimulus funds uh, to bail out the economy. We didn't have a finding of no significant impact. We missed all those billions of dollars that were funneled into the economy. Uh, so we missed that. And we were just kind of sitting around and then all of a sudden this infrastructure uh, bill, uh, $1.2 trillion gets passed. Well, guess what happened? <laughs> and this is a good thing, I'm not complaining. This is all good for the future and that's what we got to keep our eye on is the future. But all of a sudden, everybody that wants one of these and has been dreaming about having one of these is now working on one of these. I wish them all the same success that we have. And in 20 years and 14 and a half million dollars, I'm sure they'll be ready. I hope it's much quicker than that. I and, pretty, well, wait a minute, I'll let you finish. <laughs> <laughs> My hope is that um, all of a sudden they all come in all at once and then we can go to Congress and say, look, the program's way too small. <laughs> you know, I share your sentiment 100%, Rick, and, and your vision on this over the years that you've been associated with this great organization has certainly uh, transmitted that thought to many, many people. I, I share yours. And that's why I think projects like NLX and TCMC here in our neck of the woods and a couple others around the country, they need to get going quickly. The faster they get going, the easier it appears will spur on more and harder work on others. And they will come in a lot faster. We need to cut the travel time down to get one of these from 20 years to a couple of years and then a couple of years to build. Uh, that, that's got to happen uh, for this vision for the country to be better connected. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks, Ken. And uh, here comes another question that I, uh, has to do with, I guess, the rider experience or sort of practical matters. Lauren Stark asks, will there be space on the train to transport bicycles? Yes, Lauren, um, there will be. Um, we plan on using the, uh, and actually I'll, I'll throw this one over to Rick. You've been on these cars, um, the new uh, interstate, uh, the ones the states are for their intercity passenger rail. Yeah, so so the end, it would be the, probably the same equipment that is currently being deployed for Chicago to Milwaukee, Chicago to St. Paul, or not St. Paul, Chicago, St. Louis. Louis, Kansas City, thank you, and Chicago to the three Michigan routes. And they do have bike racks on 
every car. We're producing a video to help our elected officials in Minnesota and Wisconsin wrap their arms lovingly around this project. And uh, we've got some great video in there of these new cars and the new engines that uh, Siemens is building for uh, the service that Rick was talking about and others around the country. And um, they're, they're state of the art. Uh, they look wide and comfortable. Um, and yes, uh, bicycles and Wi-Fi and all those great things that make travel enjoyable are gonna be on, that, on those uh, cars. Yes, a big step up from what's running today. Huge step up. Thanks. And I assume that question came from the standpoint of someone who wanted to you know, get on one of those bikes and, and ride away when they reach the destination. Here's another question about connectivity uh, from Martin Green. Under the assumption that many people traveling from the cities uh, to Duluth are actually traveling beyond to the North Shore, for example, what connections will there be in Duluth, such as car rental agencies or something else? That's a good question and an area that uh, will improve drastically once the train starts running. Right now, uh, Duluth rental agencies are located at the airport. Obviously, they're going to have to locate downtown uh, in connection with uh, where the train is going to come in here to the historic Union Depot. Uh, about a block from here is the Duluth Intermodal Transit Facility. Um, we anticipate some sort of moving sidewalk covered, of course, because of that winter uh, that we have up here. But similar to the airport, there's about a block and a half of uh, distance between the train station and the intermodal bus station, which has intercity bus as well as uh, uh, Duluth Transit Authority buses. Uh, I anticipate that uh, there'll be uh, car rentals here. Uh, there's a great space for, um, you know, this whole thing that's starting to take off is, is ride share or car share, where, um, you know, you're a part of a club and you just come in and whatever's in the lot, you enter your passcode and then boom, you're, you're on the way and you return it when you're done and they've got your credit card. I anticipate something like that coming in. Um, right now, Duluth is a Uber desert for whatever reason. Um, the, we have more taxis uh, than we have Uber drivers on most days of the week. Um, something about Duluth, I don't know. But um, to answer the question, honestly, I would have to say that the interconnectivity on the Duluth end is going to have to improve from where it is right now. It's not bad, but uh, the train will indeed. As I said, this is a train that's gonna change everything. And Duluth interconnectivity is going to be one of the things that's going to benefit greatly when this train pulls into the station. Great, and uh, speaking of stations, I, I believe that one or both of you mentioned uh, the need to construct new station stops and uh, this question from Chris Lilliblad uh, asks, is the property available for all the station construction that's needed? Yes, um, these are historic stops uh, along the route. Uh, Minneapolis is already the termination for the North Star uh, on the lower track level. And on the upper track level, uh, the Hiawatha light rail, that's in Minneapolis. Uh, Greg, again, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, you, ha you have more knowledge of that south end of the line than I do. Uh, at uh, Coon Rapids, Coon Creek, there's already an existing uh, North Star station, which could be utilized. Uh, in Cambridge, as I say, they've moved their historic site of their station uh, to accommodate a growing downtown, um, but the city owns the property. Uh, it's, uh, they own, that's, that's their land that they're gonna build on. Hinkley, um, there is some property available, um, but a new station will have to be built. Superior, um, there's property available uh, that the city owns uh, that has been designated for this. Um, and then of course in Duluth, we've got the, the depot here. Yeah, I, would, I would just add that we, we do need to do some modifications in Minneapolis just to lengthen the platform for the longer trains. Right. And I think in Coon Rapids, we might actually be building a new station. There's because there's so much traffic through there um, on, on BNSF, it may be difficult to access the commuter station. Great. I'm going to, um, as a follow up on that, uh, Ken, you just mentioned the Duluth station. I'm going to slip in this question from Frank Wilkie. Where are you stopping in Superior? Uh, very good. Frank, good to hear from you. I hope you're enjoying your stay on the West Coast. Um, 
the stop in Superior is um, right along uh, what used to be the uh, Great Northern's main line out of town. It's now called the Coal Runner. And um, it serves the uh, Merck dock. And that's exclusively all it does. Um, and it runs behind a shopping center uh, right along Belknap Avenue, Belknap Viaduct, right on the edge of what's known as the Hill Yard, um, not for the terrain, but for James J. Hill. And uh, so it's right along there, right along the Coal Runner, uh, right behind this shopping area where there is uh, plenty of uh, parking space. And I'll give a little shout out to Superior uh, because of a couple of reasons. One is uh, they've, all, they've been a partner of this project since the very beginning. Uh, their mayor, Jim Payne, is probably one of the most vocal proponents of this. He was just recognized by All Aboard Wisconsin uh, as one of the voices for increasing passenger rail service. He will talk about this to anybody and everybody that will listen. He's a bicycle enthusiast as well. Um, and um, if you're a type A person and even if we are able to speed up that choke point over the uh, grassy point draw, and I include this in all my presentations, if you're a type A person and you live in Duluth or up the North Shore and you're commuting to Duluth to get on the train, nothing against Duluth because we are the tourist destination for certain. But if you are a type A person, drive to Superior, get on the train, your trip is just less than two hours, just barely less than two hours. So you shave about 25 minutes at least off the trip from Superior to Duluth. Now, for me, that just means another beer in the club car. But um, if you're a type A personality where you got to move, go to Superior. Great. We've got about 10 minutes left and about a half a dozen questions. So hopefully we can get to these all. Uh, uh, Ken, you'd already uh, urged people to contact their elected officials and this question concerns politics. Uh, Mark Perot asks, Minnesota politics can be complex. Is the outrage over the cost and delays to Southwest Light Rail adversely affecting the prospects for this? An excellent question. I will tread lightly. Um, yes. Um, it's very easy to lump all rail projects together and to pick out the ones that haven't been as successful as others and say, see, they're all going to fail or they're all going to be over budget or they're all going to be uh, over time as far as completion. But I went back, I wanna go back to what I said about North Star and what the pandemic did to not only North Star, but commuter lines across the country. Look at the Northeast Corridor. Um, it's just wrong to lump an intercity passenger train service with a commuter line, which basically is what the Southwest Rail is. That's also a commuter line. Um, not commenting on any of the problems that project is having, but I think it's unfair to lump them together. But does it happen? Yes, it does. It does happen that, you know, Southwest Rail is, is thrown up as a roadblock to Northern Lights Express. But, you know, it's our job as the promoters of this, and Rick knows this better than anybody, projects around the country. We need to highlight the successes. We need to remind everybody that this is a transportation system that works everywhere else in the world. Why would we think we're so different? Good point. <laughs> uh, here's a question about the infrastructure uh, from Jerry Ratliff. When does uh, the Grassy Point bridge work begin? I'll throw that one to Greg. Uh, sure, and I think I touched on this before, but uh, our freight side of our office is, is having conversations with BNSF, so there's uh, no timeline at this point. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Greg. Uh, and then uh, Mike Engelhart asks, in terms of train set, do you envision single or bi-level train cars? I think uh, Rick kind of answered that. I think we're going to use the same uh, um, consists that are being produced right now by Siemens for engines and cars that are uh, being used by state 
supported sub or state subsidized services such as uh, Chicago to Milwaukee and uh, Chicago to St. Louis and other cities around the country. Um, these are very, very popular. I think they're going to be incredible. Rick wrote on them and uh, shared some of his comments with me, and I, I think that they're going to be extremely popular. Delivery might be a problem as far as the timeline goes, because I think everyone's going to want one of these right away, and uh, it's going to take uh, Siemens a while to ramp up to get them, but uh, that's all part of what that three to four years of build out is going to be about. I mean, it's not just the track that has to be produced and uplaid and so forth, but also those uh, train sets need to be produced. Great, thank you. And uh, from Kirk Schneider, here's a question about scheduling and connections again. Uh, is there any way this project could be combined with the second daily Chicago to St. Paul train that you've mentioned? Uh, that is uh, that is in the works, uh, or even as a as a future expansion. I think Greg is uh, best suited to to answer that one. Uh, thanks. So, you know, that project is much further along, and we're in the process of you know gearing up on final design and construction, and we're getting ready to work on those agreements with uh, Canadian Pacific and Amtrak. So we don't. So we're proceeding with that. We don't have the state share the funding for NLX yet, so it's difficult to combine those two at this point. Thank you, Greg. Um, uh, let's see, Ken, uh, you have a, an invitation to write an article. Why don't we handle that one offline? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know, they're clearly the interest in this is, is, is very great. Uh, and um, Let's see, this might be our final question, and it, uh, it's an appropriate one for a, something sponsored by the High Speed Rail Alliance. Richard Pardo asks, is there any hope to transform these plans to a high speed rail project for at least part of this plan? Well, thank you for that, uh, Rick. And yes, um, right now uh, we're looking at a stretch of 90 mile an hour uh, speed. Um, Greg can probably tell you more on the technical side of the other areas that will be sped up as well. But, um, you know, this is basically the average speed on this thing will be about 70 miles an hour, I think, is if I'm right on that, Greg. So you'll be traveling at about a speed comparable with an automobile of about 70 miles an hour. Would it be nice to speed up more of the route? Yes, it would be. But you got to walk before you can run, or in this case, go slow before you can speed up. Yeah, I, I would maybe just add a couple things to that. Thank you. I can. So as part of our earlier analysis, we did look at up to 110 miles an hour and, it, you know, we looked at the eight trains as well and we came away with, again, the most cost effective and best return on investment was at four trains a day at the 90 miles per hour. So, you know, it was considered, but um, probably not uh, prudent at this point. So, um, you know, we are doing some modifications of curves and some other bridge improvements, and, and as Ken mentioned, lengthening sidings and putting in new ones so that it will speed up the corridor and, and increase uh, capacity and eliminate some of those choke points. So, um, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, uh, Greg's absolutely right. We did look at all these alternatives, and one of the reasons we settled on a 400 and uh, $25 million project is because the 110 mile an hour project was over a billion dollars. And we just thought the pushback on that would mean, yeah, it'd be nice, but it'll never happen. So uh, from a cost efficiency, uh, the greatest return, which by the way, this does have a positive return uh, for every dollar spent, we get more back uh, and that's good. Uh, but the, um, we just thought the political pushback to a billion dollar train project would just be immense and uh, insurmountable. So uh, we, we picked the times we did and the speeds we did because we thought it was the most achievable. Uh, it competes with the automobile, which is the key here. And um, I think that uh, we've got a great project uh, going forward and I think others will model after us. Could we speed it up more in the future? Well, of course we can. All right. Well, thank you, Ken, and thank you, Greg. I, uh, we have had lots of comments in the chat as well, but I think I got to all the questions. I hope I did. Uh, so thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, both uh, Chris and Rick, for this opportunity. Uh, Greg, thanks for uh, 
staying with me to make sure I don't uh, get anything wrong. I appreciate that as well. And most importantly, as I said at the very beginning, I appreciate everybody in Rick's organization around the country that uh, works and believes and supports passenger rail service. You know, the one great thing about America is that we can pretty much do and have, and we're very fortunate this way, anything we want, as long as, as a group, they're strong enough, that group is strong enough to support what it is we want. And without the grassroots efforts of groups like Rick's and others around the states, we wouldn't be where we are today, and we certainly won't be where we need to be in the future. So thanks to everybody for their continued support. And anytime you can talk about it and promote it, always remember the people that are going to make the decisions are your elected officials, and they work for you. So remind them of that kindly, gently, and often. On mute. Um, you can uh, do that at highspeedrail.us. Uh, we have a form there where you can send a, a generic message, but you can change it. Uh, highspeedrail.us. Uh, please go and take action. Um, and uh, thank you again, Ken and Greg, for joining us today. And um, I'm hoping that uh, when that uh, you'll be the first out of the box for funding when that the, the infrastructure funding comes out. And so. if I may add, may add one last thought, and I know that one of our key supporters and one of the people that's worked very hard on this project from the very beginning, Jill is sitting at home going, Ken, don't forget, we have a website. We have a Facebook page. Ken, don't forget to have that mentioned. Ken, don't forget that you can Google up Northern Lights Express and get to both of those entities, our Facebook page and our website. Whew, that was close. <laughs> Excellent. So northernlightsexpress.org. <laughs> and uh, 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 thank you again for coming. We really appreciate it and uh, looking forward to rapid success.